Okay, <clears throat> hello everyone. Welcome to a very interesting episode. Because my attention has found a unique title. This episode is titled, The Self That Left a World Behind. <clears throat> and the world that left a self behind. I couldn't decide which one to make the main title of this episode. Both these sentences have an equal fascination for me. But due to this incredible artwork I found on this website, I thought a self that left the world behind may be more tangible to the human attention. You see, one of the most incredible things about the human attention is that thanks to memory, we can tunnel through reality. Just setting up my notepad, guys. Hang on. Okay. <coughs> Let me see if the viewers can see this. There's something off with this. <laughs> Hang on, guys. This is, uh... <clears throat> My God. There we go. So, <clears throat> officially I'll start the episode. So, first thing, the self that left a world behind. This is one side of the coin of this episode, and the other side of the coin is the world that left the self behind. Now, the incredible thing about these two sentences is that they fit in to, I, I guess, a sort of the pattern of 
a material the, they fit into the context of a materialist and an immaterialist so if I was to start with the second position when somebody says the world that left the self behind this is very obvious which in some sense it's a pointer to an example here is materialism why because if we consider that our sense of self is just an object it's just something that is physically kept as if we are a very unique organized and sophisticated <coughs> you know composition of the periodic table right now when the body dies pretty much that's when the world that left the self behind the world in some sense forgets about who we are one can say the value of the life now is kind of like the world is paying attention to us now just by existing like somebody right now on this planet could be the loneliest person on this planet right and it's as if the world is here to see you even though you may feel you're alone right right now in the conscious waking state it is literally a cosmic performance stage we are in the theater of the cosmos we are actors and in some sense when the actors realize they are acting you see the reason i would say that okay okay i'm going too too fast in Vedic thought, there's this concept called Leela, L-E-E-L-A, and the idea of this, Leela is a play, and you would say it's kind of like the state of consciousness Shakespeare was in, where it was as if he realized life is a sort of theater, and literally the manifestation of attention experienced through existence is a sort of action. Now, check this out. If the actor has an audience, then the actor is acting. But if the actor has no audience, the actor is just being itself. This is an important distinction to make, you know. <clears throat> because in some sense, the act is for something. It's like, we, we're, it's like our eyes have opened as a creature on a planet. And we're kind of like, okay, why is existence happening? And it's as if like this theater performance is happening for an audience beyond our eyes. That means if right now 8 million human beings are on a rock in the middle of nowhere, we're on a stage, imagine like a theater stage, right? It's as if the greater dimensions, let's say going towards the invisible and, con and inconceivable, it's as if they are watching us. It's like this strange feeling in existence where you feel could the non-existing to the existence be watching. It's another way of saying because we start off from a visible position, we contrast that into, you can say, the opposite where in some sense it's an invisible. So if you look at human beings right now, we are like this physical phenomena and the moment our physical desires are met what happens we go towards psychological desires and psychological desires are not physical right me right now my voice let's say it, it has a sort of reality value and my physical body existing here has a sort of realness right but the idea of me both to the viewers and to myself is invisible Right? And when I say it's invisible, I should say it this way, not invisible as in, uh, I would say it, it's, not, it's like it's not existing in the same way an object is, right? <clears throat> One of my most fascinating, fascinating realizations on life was actually from this quote from Ludwig Wittgenstein, where he says, the limits of my language are my world. And it seems like the limits of the stories we tell ourselves is limited to how much the attention is, has familiarity moving in language, right? <clears throat> and uh, let me say it this way. You can't hold a subject in your hand, but you can hold an object.
<coughs> Excuse me, this was on mute. I don't know for how long. But, uh, Excuse me, to continue. You know guys, in, in, in the part that was just muted, in, that, in those couple minutes I just checked, pretty much I'm trying to say this episode has two sides to the coin. There's the self that left the world behind and there's the world that left the self behind. The idea of a world that left the self behind, an example of it, is in some sense our physical, biological body. What this means is that it's like poetically the idea of the afterlife, it's pretty much what happens after our life. You know, it, it's not necessarily a physical idea if you look at it from the side of the coin where the world leaves behind the self. It's another way of saying that our afterlife is the life of all those who will be born. The future generations are technically the afterlife of the species. Of those who transition. What I'm trying to say is that the world goes on the planet is 4.5 billion years old and it's going to be around for a while. And so this is the cool thing about life, regardless of how much you have been a good or bad person, the world will change and this, there will be new actors on the stage. When it comes to mystical inquiry, when it comes to, let's say, philosophical observation, the human being must find contentment in four modes of looking at things. I personally feel anybody who finds contentment in, in these four states, in these four views, you pretty much are at the peak of the philosophical dimension. <clears throat> pretty much reality has one approach to it, is that it's nothing. It's zero, it's void. This is important that the human species needs to have a relationship with its own emptiness. Most people think emptiness means there's nothing there, but emptiness is, is another way of the mind uh, being conscious of its absence before its absence. That's the power of emptiness. You know, it's like when someone, when, if, if someone was to go and read the book, uh, Hagakura, the book of the samurai, they would be fascinated to find that there are quotes in there that samurai, from the beginning of the day, they would acknowledge their death. You know, it's like human beings go on living and fearing death their whole life, but the samurai, the moment he woke up, acknowledged the temporary nature of the conscious reality. Right? And it's not just the samurai, various, various human beings with various states of consciousness have lived on this planet in ways where ideological fear does not apply to them. That means imagine you become a being that the concept of fear doesn't apply anymore. The concept of fear doesn't exist. Fear is, believe it or not, one of the ultimate motivations of our pur of purpose. Even me giving these talks, <clears throat> you know, some of its content is based on my fear for the future generations. 
I see their victories, but I also see that, you know, it's a contrast. <clears throat> Somebody once suggested, like, the concept of luck, even though a person shouldn't see the idea of luck as, like, what luck means. But it, it's another way of saying that it's like when something good happens, there's a rise and fall and the universe balances out. <clears throat> so somebody could have a terrible day and if their day is too terrible out of the ordinary, they're going to notice something strangely come to counterbalance that, right? This world is so incredibly, let's say nature is so incredible that just like the body heals itself, right when somebody gets a wound the body heals itself if there is indecency in communication between human beings that decency will be about everything's coming back to on some level what the consciousness feels it can deserve not just what it deserves what it can deserve right <clears throat> So one of the most incredible discoveries of the human being was just the ability to fathom the future. Do you know? Somebody's like, yo, what did time give us? Do you know? <laughs> and somebody was like, it gave us the future, man. Now we can live before we live. We can, in our inner realms, access probabilities of the future before in our outer realms we uh, 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 animate in them or animate as them. Upon acknowledgement of zero, the zero dimension, everything, you look at stuff and you're like, all right, everything has, like, existence has a relationship with nothing, right? <laughs> then you look at it, all right, it, nothing or everything in manifestation has a relationship with the singular. That means it's as if, like, the philosopher is going, okay, so as a human being within the domains, within the spectrum of human perception, and with the ability of the human being so far to use its inner realms, it can consider something equating to zero, having no meaning, something equating into one, everything is the meaning, something equating into two, which is duality, which is the nature of chaos and order, that's like its own kind of simultaneous video game right and then <clears throat> there is the concept of infinity and what infinity means is after poetically an eternalized attention has experienced the temporary framework it begins infinity is like the last step of the staircase to eternity poetically do you know if one can say a sort of spiritual meaning of being a physical entity it's kind of like contentment it's like once we have found content it's kind of like been there done that vibe right the person's like all right <coughs> i existed as a temporary shaped entity now been there done that what's the next thing and the next thing would be technically an eternal unshaped being field of being so it's as if the human species should not only fear, uh, should not fear it, uh, fear its eyes, but realize the bliss of Satchitananda is how this whole time that affinite identification of consciousness with the universe has been happening. The universe is infinitely happening that's the incredible thing there's like an amplification right it's like there wasn't just one galaxy or there wasn't just one universe <clears throat> and of course man's identification of worldhood for now is limited to shape that means perhaps silence would be the wisest sermon for an invisible being because right now i'm talking to visible beings
so let me just finish what I'm drawing here. Material. Body. Is forgotten. By material universe. By materialistic universe. By physical universe. So as long as we identify with the periodic table, <coughs> there will be the situation where the world will move on and our existential shape will be left behind. You know, to me, I don't know why um, I was so drawn to giving these talks, but like there's moments where I think, okay, maybe some part of my psychology has concluded that what is the best thing a temporary being can do <clears throat> in a world which will continue on longer than him. And so it's really to share the eyes of history. Life is so incredible that we are in its attendance. It's like existence is like a teacher you know, getting attendance, you know, and hilariously, every child that's born, it's like the teacher's like, you know, it's like, it's like, hey kid, are you there? And then the child that's born consciousness, a metaphor for consciousness, consciousness is like present, you know, I'm present. <laughs> mind is an incredible mystery where I would say our species' understanding of it so far is just the tip of the iceberg. Right now the story of mankind is like the tip of the iceberg trying to explain the ocean. You know, it doesn't even realize its presence in the unconscious. Our personality is in the conscious domain. That's the tip of the iceberg. But the rest of the iceberg is our presence in the unconscious. <clears throat> you know, in a changing world, nobody can technically be anything. And the only reason we can identify as things is because it's changing slow. That means we are changing slower, or excuse me, the world in our in the human experience is changing slower than us that means imagine the particles of the ground that person is standing on imagine before the person started walking the road was always changing so imagine you put your foot on a road where all the particles were in motion right it would technically be like a river so imagine a, a street where the asphalt is like like a river I think that's a unique image. So, pretty much, I mean, I've, I've made this side of the coin clear, I'll move on to the other. I mean, here, I'll make this easier. Both sides of the coin, with these, both these demand views. Let me actually get rid of all this here. So pretty much, let's say this side of the coin, the self that left the world behind, just this view. This view can have, let's say, it can divide into a material perspective, and it can divide to an immaterial perspective.
and similarly the world that that left the self behind material immaterial so I, I've already given a material example of the world that left the self behind. So this would be like the materialist perspective, which is another way of saying body dies, world continues. world that left the self behind you know the world that moved beyond and the future generations were born and if we were virtuous maybe our voice was heard by them when it comes to and uh, let me go to the material view of the self that left the world behind this one's very obvious this one is equivalent to the picture so if people look at the picture, there's this, you know, modern girl, let's say futuristic girl, looking outside of the window. Maybe she's an android. I don't think she's an android, but like, it wouldn't make sense if she's an android. But, like, <laughs> but this girl is looking at Earth, and imagine that something happened on Earth that people had to go live in outer space and imagine the nostalgia right for me i'm a you know a huge and incredible advocate i i feel like the purpose of this mr within's gift channel is simultaneously the archaic revival of the legend of the castles in the sky the kingdoms in the, in the clouds you know And so imagine this feeling that you left your planet and it was as if you left the home that you had in some sense never noticed, right? That's the incredible thing, right? We don't realize the feeling of, it's like human beings right now don't have global feelings or let's say planetary level feelings. Why? Because they're still on the planet right now in history. You know, we don't know, like, human beings, you know, have just been walking on the surface. We have been literally using the planet as like a circular road, right? <laughs> You know, there is a great clue in the cosmological setting. I have this vision that when it comes to the architecture and the, the let's say, fun the fundamental blueprints to how an advanced civilization will happen on this earth, it has to follow the cosmological geometry and it also has to follow the biological geometry. For me, it's as if, like, nature is a way more ancient technology than, like, let's say, modern civilization's technology. Nature has a secret field like knowing that's unconditional. Nature is like how our unknown self is simultaneously an unknown world. <coughs> So, the self that left the world behind, the material view would be, I would say, okay, remembering Earth from outer space. I should probably hold this notepad differently. Right? Okay. Remembering Earth from outer space, the immaterial view of the self that left the world behind. This to me is like enlightenment. Okay. And many people, they think that the idea of enlightenment is like some superstitious magic, but it's like. <laughs> 
But to be honest, enlightenment is an idea that it doesn't matter if right now all the books and ideals on enlightenment were forgotten, it will come back. Why? Because the human being is an inquisitive entity, and pretty much the human being experience begins with eyes opening in a world. That's really what life is. Life is like an instantaneous access to selfhood and worldhood, right? Like in deep sleep, you know, this is one of the hardest things for philosophers to figure out that when somebody is sleeping, are they living? Like, let's say we say, I don't know, maybe I think somebody said like one third of life is spent sleeping, right? And imagine in that sleeping, in that all the time that the person has been sleeping, their body's existing, but the mind that has been living the life and having meaning is absent in deep sleep. So it's another way of saying, uh, if, if a person is in deep sleep, that means if there's no consciousness, but there's existence, did a person actually live? So it's like this mystery of like, is, is you know, uh, are we living in sleep? Or is there nobody there to live existentially? Not experiential, right? Because there's a relationship where you have of existence and then you have existence alone and then you have experience alone. But then there is the existence of experience and then there's the experience of existence, right? This is kind of like how the nature of the human mind is double-edged, right? And it's, and it's another way of saying the mind is acting like a portal and mediator between a non-physical dimension and a physical dimension. And the non-physical dimension has image, but it doesn't have the substance of the image. That means the incredible thing about imagination is that we can see it, but we can't touch it. Because imagine, like somebody imagined, let's say, I don't know, they imagined, like, uh, uh, let's say they imagined an apple pie hovering in the air. It's not like they can suddenly grab that you know, apple pie from their imagination, put it on the table, and start eating from it, right? So that's, the, that's something very important to realize about the mind, that as much as the effort of consciousness is going into being a physical maintenance of intelligence, it's also non-physically being orchestrated. You know, it's kind of like the thoughts that we act upon are the captains, are the experiential captains of, let's say, existence in its ship. <clears throat> really what life is, is an ability to respond to the moment. To just be conscious of it, right? Some people think like they have to go look for happiness, right? not realizing what is happiness is it outside of you or is it inside of you and let's say somebody attained uh, like external happiness let's say right now whoever's listening to me let's say it's like a let's say the trillionaires or the billionaires or the gazillionaires <laughs> of the future may listen to me what i'm trying to say is like the physical life is incredible its maintenance honorable but if there is a force within the human being that wants to know as far as possible then in some sense the attitude to limitation must change so when it comes to a self that leaves the world behind <clears throat> that's the idea of transcendence, individual transcendence, and something that religions have in common, both polytheistic and theistic religions, they don't know it, but what they have in common is in some sense the renunciation of individualism and into, it's pretty much the transformation of free will into divine will. It's another way of saying consciousness thinks it is the king of the world and then it realizes, you know, it hasn't even entered the palace yet. You know, there's a royalty to consciousness. I speak of it in this way. Why? Because there's deep feeling within me that just knows. There's a part of me that feels like, you know, eternal beings. You know, there's a, there is a sort of eternal architect. Uh, let me say it this way, you 
know, there is poetically a hidden architect to this universe. And this architect for the solipsis is considered as their mind. But the biggest issue of the ownership of anything in a changing world is that who is moving the attention to that change? You see, a, a human being may have a question being like, am I an object? You know, like that could be a mystical question. Then the person says, am I a subject? And that could be a mystical question. But now it comes to a point where it's like who or what is looking. And it's this incredible ability of the moment to be inconceivable before an invisible subject owns a visible object. It's as if before the idea of you can own your, can move your body, it's like the space is aware of itself before what's in it. <clears throat> to me, the transcendence, if somebody was like Mr. Within, you know, what's the fastest way, you know, some you can explain, like, if there is an enlightenment, like, how do you get that? Or, like, what do you do with that? <laughs> and I will tell you, there's really one way, and many teachers could say different things, but I'll tell you, this is the secret to the Eastern <clears throat> idea of enlightenment, but because it's a, for the human being, it's a universal. So pretty much, this is the idea of enlightenment. You started off <coughs> as an object, and this object became aware of itself as a subject. So Jacques Lacan talks about something where he calls it the mirror effect, <clears throat> pretty much the child looked in the mirror and it's like, oh my god, that's me, you know? Like some animals can't make that distinction. Now, imagine after the child can tell itself separately as a physical entity in the mirror. Now it comes to the next thing, where the child, the same way it noticed its reflection in the mirror in a outer realm, it needs to notice its reflection in the inner realm and realize there comes a creative responsibility to the origin of the context of our attention ideologically. What this means is that the child has to become responsible for initiating the game of itself in the world. So it's like, it's not just that, the, you know, a, a, there was a, the eyes opened and a body was acknowledged. After the body was acknowledged, right, a separation from the subject was acknowledged. You know, if you pay attention in language, we say a person says, I have thoughts, or I had a thought, or I have this kind of thought, right? We act like it's something we have. We think if people, like they say, my body, my mind, my soul, it's like, who's that my, you know? <laughs> it's like something unknown is owning the known. This is where true mysticism begins, guys. Where there is a silence, and then the mystery of the world of worlds has never gone anywhere. simply said enlightenment is an instantaneous truth if there is truth it has to exist if it exists it's here right now that means anybody who's searching for the truth the truth is here we are new to the scene of manifestation you know <clears throat> you know the, uh, we may th we categorize it as like young people and old people but the planet is looking at all the creatures on it and being like you're all like infants you know <laughs> you know
you know, there's this concept of Mother Earth and Father Sky. And I'm not saying this has to be on a religious level, but I'm saying that imagine <clears throat> every person has their own parents, but when it comes to the species, the mother of the species is the planet which has given birth to the existence. And the father of the species is the sky which pulls this existence towards its beyond towards the beyond you see it's like the purpose of life life seems to be existentially light entering the eyes of a creature and a creature in some sense caring to go to the source of its animation right that means this is the truly this is i would say a smart person who in some sense realizes where their limitations are it's not enough to just realize your limits but to understand why the limits are there right <clears throat> there's something that I, I would say if somebody was like a servant and what you, when you were younger what were you chasing <laughs> I would say in, when it came to two, uh, before 2011 I was chasing objects but after 2011 it was as if some part of me noticed something about the story of the world doesn't make sense. Yeah, it was like people were saying, you know, we are thoughts, and then it's like there's thinking, and then it's like it's a thought thinking. Do you know what is the mystery of consciousness? What are the dimensions of our eyes? You know, we're not taught this. This is something that it's like every soul has to awaken to it. It's another way of saying it's like. Um, there's a part of us that has never changed and somehow this must be recognized in a changing realm because this would be the same as saying a transcendence beyond fear. If you pay attention, the human existence is it's technically temporary. If I identify as a physical being, I would have no reason for my emotions to exist. Let me tell you why. Because if the person would be like, okay, I'm going on in this life, you know, trying to, you know, <clears throat> accumulate, you know, you know, be a king of my own kingdom, you know. But it's as if at the end of it, at the end of life, everybody leaves empty-handed. Life is kind of designed to give the illusion that you can hold on to something forever. But really what it is, is that it's like waves. It's like, it's like there's peaks and troughs, you know. You could say physical desire is the peak of the existential lifetime in the sense of the energy to go after it, right? It's, but I will tell you at the same time, it's like the person's like, okay, if my body's going to be out of the picture at the end of this life, and then my mind, which is just based on my body, is probably going to be out of the picture. So if there is no body, no mind, what is going to happen to that energy that was being me? And technically, it's this, it's this unique situation where the best way I have found to extract this in language, to put it in language, is that it's a relationship between the visible, the invisible, and the inconceivable. This is another way of honoring the ancient view, you know, the old school views of spirituality, which is body, mind, soul, right? <clears throat> and really what spirituality means, just to make this clear for, for I would say, let's say for the human species of 2022, Spirituality means you have noticed an unknown variable to your previous reality of meaning. That means imagine your every person's world, like inner world, or every per the world that every person sees is like a formula. And imagine that formula, imagine like 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? But now imagine it's like 2 plus 2 equals 3 plus x, and the x is the unknown variable. 
right? It's as if suddenly in the middle of something, something unknown has come. It's like this physical, temporary, objective entity is like, okay, what am I doing here existing, right? It, you know, and so the question comes, okay, the experiential dimensions are unknown. We're like a species that if you, again, if you put it in contrast to the 4.5 billion years, that the planet uh, the, has been around, it would be as if like just recently, just yesterday, the species attained, like uh, the species achieved language acquisition. And so we were no longer just, our value system was not just physical stuff, but human beings began wondering about what do emotions mean? And even currently when I, when I look at YouTube and you know, some of the videos that are trending, you know, now, you know, sometimes I study the psychology of a human being, but when it comes to politics, it's like studying the psychology of a nation. People don't realize it, but philosophers and psychologists in the future, or poetically, the grandchildren of the greatest psychologists and philosophers, they will be those who will be able to hold the universal ground, the global stability for a species to, in some sense, graduate from its uh, attachment to a chunk of land. You see, the human species pretty much came up with subjects, put it on objects, and said, I own this object now. My name is on it. You know, this it's like this color represents my nation. You know, this wall represents my border. You know, this is, do you see what I'm saying? It's like we're taking pride in, in, in subjectively, artificially owning fragments of a rock. Right? Rather than the whole species being like, okay, everybody chill out. We're on a rock in the middle of nowhere. The species has greater problems. That means pretty much two major tasks. It's like, to me, it's like, on a part of me feels like telling the whole species, everybody, like if I could, let's say, you know, shout this at a cosmos and, you know, the edges of the universe could hear. Or let's say the edges of humanity could hear. There is two great challenges which every human being who has any love or compassion for your species, for its future. That means caring for the future of a person, that's a sort of love. But to care for the future of your species is the ultimate possible physical love. Do you know? And the, the right now, the way I would say the species is caring for itself or loving itself is through fragmented simulations, right? It's just like, you know, there's ratings for movies, like there's PG-13 and like R-rated movies. Similarly, the world is like that, where right now we're in the PG-13 view of the world. And then it's like mysticism is this recognition that the, <laughs> the naked reality the ultimate reality of the nature of this being surpasses conceptual uh, bunkering down, which is another way of saying we, it's like the species stepped out of physical caves, but anybody who has, a, has their belief system doesn't update, or they don't realize it's a changing world where they're ha having their beliefs. It's another way of saying, like, it's dishonesty. You know, religions talk about honesty, but how, what is the depth of that honesty? For me, I am fascinated by the idea of God. To me, God is, is not language. It is the mover of language, you know. Some people worship the message, others wonder who sent it. And that's a very, I would say, more of an honest state, right? <clears throat> it's like being a young kid raised in a theocracy and being like, is everybody worshiping the inconceivable? Like, what is, what's going on here? And you realize that the mind provides the opportunity of man to interact. And I would say religion is that historic moment 
when there was a common denominator in every individual's conceivable universe. That's the power, I would say, the religious structure. It's as if, like, when you reach the edge of the conceivable, you're like, what next? And you realize if there is to be ownership, you're going to remain conceivable. You know, it's pretty much this poetic thing where how you get out of the cycle of reincarnation is by realizing you were never something that was reincarnated. That's why I'm saying, I said earlier, you know, the only thing to say about enlightenment is it's an instantaneous truth, and an instantaneous truth is an implication of being. So it's like there is, there is no enlightened activity, there is an enlightened being, you know. The activity is either in tune, it's, it's either like right now, let's say I'm a point of intelligence and I'm giving this talk. I would say this whole talk comes down to how much I am in tune with the space where I am existing prior to experience moving. It's another way of saying, it's like you find yourself in a world, you first get comfortable with the space where the world is happening, then get comfortable with the content of the space. So it's another way of saying we became conscious, it's like we appreciate the emptiness of the world because that emptiness gives an allowance for there to be fullness. We appreciate the fullness of the world because the fullness allows us to review the emptiness. But ultimately, it comes down to a point where beyond this, it, it pretty much what death is, is like the end of the limit of humanization. Pretty much it's another way of saying if the psychology goes further, let's say pretty much the idea is like there is an afterlife or there isn't. It's like a coin flip of truth. Even Socrates said, I would either go somewhere, you know, where there is no Socrates or I would go somewhere where all the questions that I have wondered about, I would be their answer. What if there are ways the world is happening that it goes beyond the fear of death? It goes beyond the concept of an ending. And the moment we go beyond the concept of an ending, the beginning was never the beginning. <clears throat> because how can change happen for an intelligence that finds itself in the middle of a system? Right now, the human species can't, doesn't know the ancient secret truths and doesn't know the future truths. It's like the beginning and the end of life is not accessible on the earth. In the, in the beginning and oh, I should say the future. The beginning and, or let's say pre-beginning and post-ending of life is not accessible to the creature that finds itself in the middle of life. It's another way of saying the immediate past is known, maybe the immediate future can also be known, but, <clears throat> you know, the distant past and the distant future remain as unknown. And if the past has an unknown possibility and the future has an unknown possibility, the question comes that the present is unknown. And it's an implication that even if you're a spiritual person hearing me right now, there is something deeper than the idea of oneness and just being in the here and now. For 4.5 billion years, for, for as many year, every years of our evolution, we were unconscious. That was oneness supreme. You know, it's as if before the free will was moving us, what was moving us? 
you know, and it was like a world where its will was not categorized <coughs> or spectrumized. Just to finish off what I'm drawing here on the notepad, this would be the idea of transcendence. Maha Samadhi. <coughs> when it comes to the immaterial view, the world that left the self behind, I would say from a religious perspective, it would be like everything goes back to its source and this can be God, the idea of God for example. The human species has to have an ability to acknowledge both states and all the states. Pretty much I've simplified it to that, alright, we want the most advanced civilization to build the most advanced civilization we need the most advanced beings. To have the most advanced beings, what beings are like minds, and it's in, it's another way of saying it's like <clears throat> the most advanced human being is a state of mind, and it's a state of mind that is acknowledging itself in the most advanced way, which was another way of saying it's like 
uh, the advancement of all dimensions of our being will equate the advanced human being, the advanced communicator, and then the advanced humanity will build the advanced civilization just by the nature of being advanced. Every moment of history really has a great transformation. And I feel every lifetime has like, if it's a performance, if it's an act, <coughs> an act of existence, experience of existence, or experience is acting in existence. It's like there's a moment where the performance will be brilliant. And it's like the true masterpiece of, of the heart will in some sense shine out of the, let's say, brain. It's pretty much the ultimate effort of the lifetime. And so the idea is, is that human beings, they don't have a choice on, <clears throat> you know, their existence, you know. They don't have a choice in regards to like, you know, their DNA and all of this, right? But their choices come in how they can choose to see what they are, right? It's like the human being has an ability to physically change, <coughs> physiologically change, and the human being has an ability to psychologically change. We need a species where when there is a self, the self has no fear of leaving the world behind. That means it's like we can either fear what will happen or on some level we can choose to see if we can even love it. <clears throat> Imagine we loved our world to a point where it could not make a mistake. You know, I think this is why, you know, for religious people, God is so perfect because they are loving the inconceivable. You know, I would say I'm, I feel like, you know, <clears throat> sometimes religious without the ideology though. It's like I'm in the presence of a living universe. It's like the world is conscious, not just because we are. We know that consciousness emerges in the space of a mind. <clears throat> so technically we can say existence emerged in greater consciousness. Guys, I need to make this a shorter episode, so I'm going to see what final statements I could say about this. <coughs> Let me turn off the music. The self that left a world behind, our choices, and those selves that we leave behind, they become our memories. And so really, every day we wake up and we say, yay, it's a new day, that's like literally we've left the self behind, you know. <clears throat> or excuse me, but that new self is, is, is in a state where the past self is not in. There's so many ways to see these sentences echo, and just various concepts. But to me, the world that left the self behind That would literally be like the universal intelligence is beyond human intelligence. It means like we're not the main event. The self that left the world behind in that view, we are the main event.
and these two sentences could even be seen like a yin yang symbol. It's not like the proper view, but I think people get the idea. The poet Rumi has this thing where he says, out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a place I will meet you there. <clears throat> and this might sound strange, but I feel all our souls are already in the future. And our bodies are defined by the past, and the mind is pretty much here to interact with its own future. Past projected future. What I'm trying to say is like... Everything that we're calling life is a relationship between the known and the unknown. If everything was known, there would be no reason for anything to move. But because there's unknown dimensions, there's a reason for there to be activity. This is another way of saying the unknown is primordial. <clears throat> so anybody who wants to comprehend the secrets of this world, it's done through an unknown self. But it's not like your unknown self is like, you know, some like, you know, uh, whisper from another dimension. It's more like that your unknown self is how the universe knows itself before you are knowing it as a human being. It's pretty much another way of saying how does the world know it's being the world before a self in that world notices it's also being the world. Attention is moving in many ways and is the task of the advanced humanity to wonder about all the possible dimensions. As if like a fearless, you know, eternal viewer of possible, pos of, of, of the possibilities of reality. That's really what it is. Everybody's understanding is limited to how possible their perception is. And because there's a mystery to life, it's like rather than worshiping an exclamation point, we, you know, we become fascinated by a question. If there is the probability and potential of greatness, if, if one human being has fathomed the idea of something advanced, it's another way of saying existence has a sense, <coughs> you know. Whoever you are, wonder about your dimensions and like a hunter gather, <coughs> you know, of the minds of mankind. It's like our, right now, the ultimate tribe is that we're all part of the same species and the same species, just by being in a species, it's like we're inside a subjective tribe, right? You know, it doesn't matter if a person is good or evil, they're still existing as a member of the species. You know? And I don't know how to say this, but I think there is no greater feeling for an individual entity than collective victory.
human, the human species has control over the, the life it simulates and overlays on existence. Pretty much we can move as a physical entity and that's like the body moving in space on you know, and then we can move as a subjective entity. So it's like our mind is our body in another dimension. Or poetically what the mind is, it will come down to how attention is like a first person point of view, kind of one sided view. <clears throat> it's like we know what we're looking at, but we don't know who's looking. That's really the ultimate mystery to solve. It's like when we can't measure the sky, where are the eyes of the species going in this world? Like life is an incredible ability to get to see what, what the most advanced state of it is. Like the idea of advancement is so beautiful to me. I don't know, I think it's like the only <coughs> great reason for living I found. That the potential doesn't need to dim. It's like every moment has a hidden potential. It's like, okay, let's say somebody's like, you know, baking an apple pie or something, you know. <laughs> I personally don't even eat pies at all, but like I'm saying, Okay, let's say somebody's baking an apple pie, and then at the same time as they're baking the apple uh, apple pie, this idea comes to them where like there's probably somebody on this planet who could have the same, be in the same setting I am, creating this apple pie and make it way better than me. So it's just like this idea that there's like somebody who can cook better than you, or like let's say you're an engineer, you just have this knowing that there's greater engineers out there. Similarly, it's a suggestion that you yourself in that moment have a greater angle as well. Right? To me, the unknown gives a reason for reason to exist. And it's hilarious because those people who fear the unknown, they are fearing what is holding their knowledge, what is giving purpose to their knowledge. And somebody became the ultimate scholar in the future and so they asked them you know hey man how do you become the ultimate scholar you know? <laughs> and the ultimate scholar says I just realized it's all here it's all just happening in a changing world I think contentment with change is like a sort of point of ultimate intelligence. We are identifying with how the world is changing, so we think we're the world that's changing. But in reality, <coughs> it's literally presence of attention. Sambhava says to be a meditator doesn't simply mean to live in a cave. It means to train oneself in the true meaning of the natural state. <coughs> There's this thing where this king asked, okay, I'll just read it. The king asked, what does it mean to gain certainty? Guru Padmasambhava responded, gain certainty. That means literally a king is asking this enlightened guy, what does it mean to like gain complete certainty in life? <clears throat> and so Guru Padmasambhava says, gain certainty in the fact that since the very beginning, your own mind is the awakened state of Buddhahood. 
gain certainty in the fact that all phenomena are the magical display of your mind. Gain certainty in the fact that the fruition is present in yourself and is not to be sought elsewhere. Gain certainty in the fact that your master is the Buddha in person. <clears throat> Gain certainty in the fact that the nature of view and meditation is the realization of the Buddhas. To gain such confidence, you must practice. Literally, Guru Padmasambhava is like enlightenment kings. <coughs> Guru Padmasambhava says, when realization occurs, you should definitely be free from samsara, so that your disturbing emotions naturally subside and become original wakefulness. What is the use of a realization that fails to reduce your disturbing emotions? That means it's kind of like saying, if life was a video game, one level was like, <clears throat> you know, the physical existence of it, you know. It's like it was your, it was objects, like the person, let's say, leveled up in that they, they, they lived their visible life and accumulated cultivated conscious understanding of it. Okay, and so let's say the person then <coughs> attains a sort of like subjective, like when it comes to the inner realms, uh, you know, imagination, memory, <coughs> what we consider thoughts, these are all happening in an invisible room that's overlaid on our moment. This invisible room is that our mind is like a candle in a dark room, that the glow is the mind. So it's kind of like first level, you know, see beyond an object. Second level, see beyond the subject. Third level, see beyond your emotions. That means like, for example, when the Buddha said, <coughs> desire is the root of all suffering. It's like the person's like, oh my God, I got rid of my physical desires. And then I got rid of my mental desires. You know, that means there was no more an ego to do anything and there was no body. Uh, it's like the body was just naturally being, you know, and the mind was naturally being without, let's say, an unnatural growth movement. <clears throat> it's as if the next thing is like the, the attention detached from an object, it completed that level. It detached from a subject, it completed that level. Now it needs to detach from its emotions. Right, this is, I would say, true mysticism, where the person started in a world where they were infused in all its dimensions, and as they lived in this life, they began to have be able to discriminate, right? And life is so incredible because it's literally like a chess game between a self that's moving a world and a world that's moving a self. <clears throat> you know, it's pretty much like a chess game between the known and the unknown. So anyways, the self that left the world behind, <clears throat> if that self is technically, let's say, eternal and the world is temporary, that's literally like the mind, it technically, origin of consciousness was here before consciousness of existence could test it, could verify existence. It's like our own universe is, is a solipsistic, it's like our own truths are like a, inside a solipsistic universe, <clears throat> you know, and the truth beyond our eyes is like, you know, it's like truth is somewhere. You know, it's like, imagine if somebody's like, you know, let, let's say somebody goes to an enlightened, like a disciple goes to this enlightened guru and says, hey, enlightened guru, <clears throat> if, is truth energy, right? Imagine, it's like, what happens to energy when there's truth? Like, nobody wonders about, like, if God is an energy or not, whether the energy is conceivable or not. are simultaneous.
simultaneously the director of our world and actor and even like the stage and the set. I think if there's a meaning to life, <coughs> it's the it's the opposite of the ignorance of all dimensions. It's literally like the body's here to perform on some level to be used. And then when it comes to the mind, the mind is here to understand. That means if, if we say physical living, that's the purpose of a body. But when it comes to a mind, the mind is not an object. So what is the purpose of something that's not an object? And it would be in some sense, <coughs> you know, a relationship between the invisible and the inconceivable. This is the difference between really all those people who consider themselves to be spiritual and those who are not because they're allowing their attention to be able to confront an intensity of reality. So let's say <clears throat> the average man is wondering about the visible and the invisible. The spiritual individual is wondering about the invisible's relationship with the inconceivable. It's like the moment you feel like your body is a vehicle for your attention. It's like you want to realize who the true driver of this moment of your manifestation is. Like this question is more fascinating than the depression that makes life meaningless. Right? That means there's no argument to this. It's like which is more interesting to end the show or to wonder why we're acting in it. Why are we found in a world? You know, to, for me, I would say one of the most incredible things that opened my mind was that I gave myself a permission to consider what would it, the world mean if nobody knew. If it's as if if I was alone on, on an island, what would be the meaning of ultimate meaning of reality? Do you know? <clears throat> and right now I'm in a civilization, in an organized setting, the meaning is filtered through the culture. But, I, but I'm saying like, it's like, it's like poetically, let's say even we tackled this notion, or I shouldn't say tackle, let's say we <coughs> transcended the idea of enlightenment, and pretty much it was like 8 billion, let's say everybody was enlightened and the world was enlightened. It's like, what would be the next act? You see, it's as if free will has an ability to bring about the reality. Free will is a force. Our eyes are like an unknown force. Really, I feel consciousness. If light beams are entering our eyes, consciousness feels like something's being projected outside of your eyes, like something's looking through your eyes. And it's not a thing. It's not an object or a subject. It's not like, you know, a hidden interdimensional entity, and it's not a physical entity. It's at some level just the ability of the mind to consider the unknown. For me, the, the conclusion or the finale of my, let's say, metaphysical search for truth was really to realize that what if truth is the unknown? Not just truth is unknown, but it is the unknown. That means the original nature of reality is unconditional. That means existence is unconditionally, conditionally changing. So the mystery of reality surpasses the energy that technically from one side of the coin, energy cannot be created or destroyed from the other side of the coin, civilizations are rising. What if we were free before we needed to be? What if the ultimate state of reality is already here? And this is why the concept of faith and trust in the future is so important. You know, <clears throat> it's like a lot of people say, I have faith in God, not realizing the soul is God, what God theologically imbued in man. 
So it's like people think human beings are worshipping God, but from God's perspective, God is looking through its own eyes. That means that the soul is like how God is watching everybody. But what God is is not a concept. So us having the concept of God is like, this is the challenge, a philosophical challenge of religion, right? <clears throat> Where it's as if we say God has no partner, but we're, the ideology is being equivalent to God. That means God is not an idea. And that should be enough for every person to s just realize we are explorers in an unknown world rather than like people fighting over truth. Like what is that? You know, it's like we're fighting over truth in a changing world. It's like, <clears throat> you know, the audacity, you know, of a species in the, in the world. Like literally our species is bored and we're like, okay, you know, let's, let's get chaos and order going. <laughs> It's, uh, I, I'm telling you, we have the, the, the ability, the chess moves that our species has <coughs> against this, uh, you know, chess game with time and I'm not know. It's really that in the air, in the sectors of our consciousness where we're capable of movement, we bring forth that movement. Behind every person's eyes, it's like st stepping onto another planet. There's like hidden worlds behind our eyes. <clears throat> and the fullest realization is to be like, oh my god, this whole time I have been conceptually accepting something that is instantaneously original. That means this notion, that means even humanization, <clears throat> being a human being is like a phase of truth. It's not, do uh, you know what I'm saying? It's literally like, why should eight billion creatures be on a rock and all 4.5 billion years just to be conscious of their suffering and the empty-handed potential of the afterlife. Like really what life is, is that we have come here for a sort of work. And if the species is smart, it will honor the, the natural dimensions. And literally it's like we, we will have, I, I don't know how to say it, but I'm kind of feeling like nature should be the ultimate, the initial value to all systems of thought. That means this is this can become dangerous if a, a, a system of thought acknowledges the human being as unnatural and behaves like it, and history forgets in the nature. <clears throat> you know, it's not just like right, like right now, to me, it's like, you know, let's say companies on an industrial level are like, you know, wiping out trees. Like, I remember somebody telling me, I think it was my brother who told me, like, there was this, like, you know, billionaire or trillionaire who was, like, who bought, like, all the forest, like, the, this giant forest place and just bought it to preserve, you know. And so it's this idea that nature is being replaced by the creations of man and mind. That means something that was on a universal or planetary level of creation is being filtered by a human perception and then that's being placed you know if it was up to me like if I, if, if somebody said mr within let's say all technologies are permissible what kind of civilization would you let's say build in this moment or what kind of advanced civilization i would pretty much be like okay we need a technology to be able to create sequoia trees and it's like imagine like giant trees between like skyscrapers right <clears throat> or imagine there's giant trees and we just build our civilization you know kind of like between that means imagine like people who wanted to travel let's say somebody wanted to go downtown it's like they wouldn't have to horizontally drive but you know they would vertically just allow themselves like it would be easy to go it would take i don't know it's like if we had a vertical sort of movement i think it, we would get to places faster but it would take us longer to get back you know, that means imagine the commute 
uh, for the working man is like, okay, get in your car, you know, go to your work, come back with your car. In the future, it's going to be like, imagine from a sky city, kind of like being shot down to earth, but in a safe and it's a futuristic way. And so it's like, if it, if it's like a vertical transport. It's like rather than a horizontal transport, like that's the idea I'm trying to get to. I thought this talk was going to end, but it seems like there's, you know, the, the speaker has more energy. You know? <clears throat> Something about the idea of an ad advanced humanity, it just like makes me feel like it's the right direction, you know. <clears throat> There's so many arguments to just conclude that, okay, the few the world is too big to get involved and every person should be like, you know, just live under the rock and feel like that's enough, no. It's as if like the most advanced should be happening because why else has consciousness come to be in a physical setting? And advancement doesn't mean technology, guys. Maybe, maybe I'm saying advancement and people think it'll be like the world becoming mechanical. No, 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 no. Advancement is in the levels of the technology, but then the user of technology. To advance, it's pretty much like we, can, we have an ability to advance the world behind our eyes. <clears throat> and we have the ability to advance the world in the outer realm. So technically, one can say there's, if there was an advanced civilization right now, let's say there was like billions of people living in that advanced civilization. It would be like billions of inner realm versions of the advanced civilization, but one actual, uh, one actual, you know, advanced civilization. Literally, life really fits the video game analogy. I think this is perfect for modern day mysticism. <coughs> you know, where we, when we wake up in the morning, we log into consciousness. When I woke up this morning, I logged in, just like a person who's playing a multiplayer online game, you have an account and then you log into that account. And what comes with that account? The body, the character. So when you log into your account and you play a game, an online game, you it's literally like the screen goes into like the third, let's say, it goes into the character, into the universe of the character. So, and really what mysticism and enlightenment is, is like you realize you're not the pixelated character on the screen. You're the one who's playing it that is not made of pixels. <clears throat> you know, it's a poetic way of saying the soul is made of, the, of inconceivable stuff. species is like 8 billion branches, uh, excuse me, it, it, uh, let me say it this way, how I see 2022 is like, let's say 8 billion birds, and these 8 billion, let's say eagles or birds, uh, let's say birds of different kinds, all of them birds, I mean just not restricted to eagles. You know, let's say blue jays too. You know. So it's like everybody is like a bird and they are on their own branch and all the branches are part of the trio, which is the planet. And so these birds are realizing they have wings. 
right? Like imagine it, like a bird. It's like, oh my God, I got wings. I got, I'm going to fly right now, right? Like, it, it, like imagine a bird that has wings but doesn't know what flight is and somehow just like figures it out. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is like imagine 8 billion birds on branches. Everybody's on their own branch. Everybody's on their own, let's say, view of the video game. And the ability for 8 billion birds on branches to simultaneously fly and associate with the sky, to associate with the greatest view of all perception of reality. That means seek not the greatest truth, but the greatest world where the truth can be found. The mind is, is like some strange blessing of uh, like a strange divine gift it's like you know if the mind is a gift these talks of mine are pretty much an attempt to open it up what would an advanced humanity look like Before we were people, we all would know. We should not fear dehumanized states of mind where there is no sense of self and or a different sense of self than the human. And we should not fear humanized states. And it's like true mastery of a multidimensional being in a world where its attention can move through the human framework or it can move through different framework or no framework. <clears throat> it's as if you find peace with the void. You made peace with the void and imagine you made peace with the singular and you made peace with duality and you made peace with the infinite and then you were left to make peace with peace and eventually, you know, it's like the wisdom. You know? Like if life, if samsara was a trick question, we are already the answer. To remember that we were, we that we are the beyond, that we are beyond before needing to be. Thanks for listening. Much blessings and all awesome.